Food, food, food. Isn't it always about food? The first question my kids ask when they come in the house is, what's for dinner? Start thinking about getting together with friends, and the main question is, what will we serve? Tell stories about your favorite childhood memories, and they often center on someone's special recipe, or cooking together in the kitchen, or what happened at the dinner table. Food is powerfully symbolic for human beings. It represents not only bodily survival, but community, and history, and tradition. For many of us, it represents love. So it is no wonder that many of the most memorable Bible stories we share center on food. And Jesus tells some of the best food stories. He often uses them to try and explain what life in the kingdom of God is like. Sometimes he's overt, like when he describes it as a banquet, where the host lays a lavish feast and all are invited and the outcasts get the best seats at the table. Sometimes he describes it like a pinch of yeast which causes a loaf of bread to rise. Sometimes he acts it out, like eating with people who no one else would touch, or turning water into wine, or breaking bread with friends. When we think about Jesus' most memorable meals, we often think primarily of the Last Supper he shared with friends on the night before he died. It has become our central story, one we reenact every time we share communion. We break the bread, and we repeat his words, and we share the food in remembrance of him. But there were many other memorable meals that Jesus shared before that last one in the upper room. There were many other instances where Jesus uses his countercultural table manners to tell a story, a political story, about how we should feed each other in the kingdom of God. And this morning's tale of a miraculous picnic is one of them. This Sunday, we are continuing our exploration into the politics of the kingdom of God. We are doing this not because we can't get enough political commentary the other six days a week, but because we long to find a meaningful framework through which to process it all. I know I do not need to tell you, we are in the thick of an election season, and most of us at this point are reaching real fatigue with the negative ads and the pundit spins and the constant emails and the partisan Facebook posts. We might hope that church would be the one place we could go and be free of politics. Well, I have some good news for you and some bad. The bad news is that we will be talking about politics this morning, but the good news is that we will be talking about it in a way that raises it beyond the power plays and the partisanship and embraces its sacred and noble purpose. For politics, in its original meaning, is the art of creating a community that reflects our highest values. And church is one of the central places where we explore and name those values together. To have a political conversation in church is to bring together the stories and the practices that embody our spiritual values with the civic processes that allow us to create a community where all people can thrive. We will not talk about which candidate to vote for or what party to support, but we will talk about the kind of society we would like to live in and what our faith has to say about that. For Jesus was not just a spiritual leader. He was not just concerned about the state of people's souls. He was also concerned with the state of their whole lives, their communities, their economies, their physical bodies as well. Were they hungry, or thirsty, or weak, or sick? Were they included or cast out? How were the children and the women treated? How was power exercised or wealth accumulated? These were all questions that Jesus was passionate about, and these are political questions. For the last few weeks, we've been exploring Jesus' political vision, what he called the kingdom of God. And it's important to remember that in Jesus' day, to name any other kingdom besides Caesar's was a subversive thing to do. But that is Jesus' whole point. There is another way to live, he tells us, another value system to embrace, one that is not based on fear or might or power over others, but one that welcomes all and shares all and is rooted in compassion and not consumption, in justice, which is always tempered with mercy. 
This was a radically different model of what was practiced in the kingdom of Caesar, and it scandalized and inspired the people who heard it. Jesus taught about this new realm in many different ways, in stories and parables and sermons and scripture quotes. But one of the most powerful ways he taught was through miracles. Miracle stories are wake-up calls that alert us that God is doing a new and unexpected thing, breaking into ordinary life with an extraordinary message. Yet they can be very challenging to us modern people. We don't quite know what to make of them. Did they really happen? Are they merely symbolic? Are we supposed to believe them? As people who take the Bible too seriously to take it literally, we don't try to parse the factuality or scientific possibility of these miracle stories. That keeps them too superficial and casts them merely as a t an attempt to prove Jesus' divinity. That's a question for faith, not proof. Whether a miracle is factually true is totally beside the point. Instead, we ask the deeper question, what do these miracle stories mean? What is the gospel trying to tell us by including this story? Knowing how powerfully symbolic food is for us and understanding bread to be a universally shared food, when Jesus takes a couple of loaves and turns them into a feast for thousands, he was making a very powerful statement about life in the kingdom of God. He was challenging the culture of scarcity and want that surrounded him and replacing it with a culture of abundance. Abundant nourishment, abundant welcome, abundant love. Whenever we see bread in the Bible, it is a sign of God's unconditional love. Manna in the desert for the wandering Hebrews, the bread offered to the prophets and Jesus in the wilderness, the multiplications of the loaves, and of course, the bread broken at the Last Supper. Each of these instances are examples of God feeding us instead of us feeding God, turning the tables on a kind of fear-based religion that requires a sacrifice to show that we are worthy. Bread in the Bible reminds us that God finds us worthy of love, abundant love, just as we are. In order to understand how truly radical this act of abundance was, it helps to understand a little something about first century table manners. For in Jesus' day, the dinner table was a microcosm of society. Who you ate with, who sat where, what was served, and who did the serving was all very carefully controlled. Eating was not just social. It was political. It reflected the community's highest values. To eat with lepers or prostitutes or sinners was to risk being shunned, to lose your place in society and become an outcast. From the beginning, Jesus defies these rules and breaks these boundaries and embodies an alternative vision of the table as a radically inclusive community. He uses the symbols of bread and wine as embodying the basic stuff of life, the gifts of the earth made available through the grace of God. He tells us clearly that these elements were not to be hoarded or rationed only to those who were worthy, but to be given freely to all regardless of who they were or where they came from. For on that hillside, Jesus was standing in a crowd of thousands, people of all walks of life, all ages, all classers, all genders, all abilities. This was not an elite dinner party by invitation only, but a messy throng of folks, hungry for both bread and grace. Jesus does not dismiss one in favor of the other, but sees the interrelatedness of both. He recognizes that people will not be able to hear his spiritual message if their stomachs are empty. So, to the disciples' shock and dismay, he invites them to cater the dinner for the crowd themselves. Understandably, they push back. You want us to do what, they ask? We don't have that kind of money. Well then, he says, empty your pockets. And he takes whatever crusts and crumbs they have, and he offers them up to God in gratitude. And then he instructs them to share it with the crowd. When all had had enough to eat, there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Trust, generosity, abundance, 
breaking out of the fear-based model of scarcity. This is the invitation we are given. This is the formula Jesus says leads to the kingdom of God on earth. And I know it sounds poetic from the distance of 2,000 years, but how are we to live out this kind of radical generosity today in our time, in our place, in our circumstances? How can we promote the politics of abundance in a world where hunger, real bodily hunger, leaves 925 million people worldwide with empty stomachs? How do we break out of an economic model that leaves some countries starving while others are throwing food away? Agricultural economists tell us that the world has more than enough food to feed its 7 billion residents. The problem isn't quantity. The problems are often the human systems that affect it. While drought is certainly the most significant problem in the Southern Hemisphere, scientists tell us that it has been exacerbated greatly by industrially induced climate change, which has interrupted weather patterns and ruined growing seasons. The second leading cause of food shortages is war. Armed conflict has displaced millions from their home, leaving crops untended in the field. In some cases, the governments use food itself as a weapon against its own people, starving their opponents into submission or cutting off the distribution of humanitarian aid at their borders. In the Sudan, warring factions have placed mines in farm fields and contaminated wells as an act of war. Yet hunger is not just an issue for the unstable, developing world. In our own nation, over 49 million Americans live in what's called food insecure households. And the reason here is both poverty and national priorities. In the recent economic downturn, where more and more people have lost their jobs, families are increasingly unable to put food on the table, and they are turning to food banks and soup kitchens for help. The increased strain on those organizations is resulting in empty shelves and underfunded feeding programs at a time when contributions are at historic lows. Yet when seeking to balance the budget, our politicians are choosing to cut nutrition programs and food stamps rather than eliminate a fraction of our enormous defense budget or suggest a tax increase for the wealthiest among us. It has often been said that budgets are moral documents. The way we choose to spend our money makes a statement about our values and our priorities. In the Gospel story this morning, Jesus holds up for us a model of community where inclusion is a priority and nourishment is a value, a place where no one leaves the table hungry, where God's grace is found in ordinary scraps of food multiplied through the trust and gratitude of those who have offered it. Yet we are mired in a way of life that sees only scarcity and lack, convinced that for one person to have enough, another must do without. To change would require that we let go of our fear-based approach to life and trust in God's abundance instead. This way of life is not easy, nor is it natural for us. It takes practice, and so we rehearse it here when we gather around our own table. The sacrament of communion is our most powerful ritual as Christians. It embodies the values of the kingdom of God in a few simple gestures that have the power to change the world. It calls us to be a different kind of community, rooted in gratitude, committed to nourishment, and open to all. Artist and pastor Jan Richardson has captured the sacred politics of this sacrament in a beautiful table blessing. And as we prepare for our own sacrament, I would like to share it with you now. To your table, you bid us come. You have set the places you have poured the wine. And there is always room, you say, for one more. And so we come. From the streets and the alleys, we come. From the deserts and the hills, we come. From the ravages of poverty and the palaces of privilege, running, limping, and carried, we come. We are bloodied with our wars. We are wearied with our wounds. Yet we hold the seed, seeds of healing. We dream of a new creation. We know the things that make for peace, and we struggle to give them wings. And yet, to your table we come. 
Hungering for your bread, we come. Singing your song in every language, speaking your name in every tongue, in conflict and communion, in discord and desire, we come. O God of abundance, we come. Amen. <laughs>